Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, with the final installments of Taking Issue with Tech Jacket. Previously, Zack chose to aid the Geldarians in their fight with their enemies, the Kresh. He had some very quick training, dominated a moon base mission, gained the affections of the Princess Lynn, then infiltrated an enemy ship and destroyed it. Returning to his allies under attack, he more or less decimated their forces, single-handedly winning the war. When he finally returns home after an undefined amount of time, he finds his parents gone and his home emptied. Issue 5 begins with Zack calling for his parents to no answer, and looking upstairs, which is just as empty as the ground floor. He walks out just in time for a displeased real tour to ask why and how he got inside. Tearing up, Zack asks what happened to the family that lived there, and seemingly a bit more sympathetic to this distress, the realtor says that they disappeared six months back, to the boy's shock, and then he excuses himself. How long have I been gone? She just told you six months! Pay attention, boy! Also, I'm not entirely sure why he didn't just admit he used to live there. Anyway, at the high school, Zack's friend from the first two issues, whose name we are finally informed is David, is talking grades with another student, Jerome, the latter of whom eventually leaves with a third unnamed student. Zack gradually approaches from the background to David's elation. After his rejection by Rebecca, having spent the following day in the bathroom, and being gone so long, it was believed that he'd gone somewhere for troubled kids. The teen veteran of an alien war eventually goes with that explanation, finding out Dave had gotten his driver's license and celebrated a birthday, but really missed his friend. Zack makes mention of him hanging with Jerome now, but it doesn't get elaborated upon as they get to Dave's car. Kinda weird. Arriving at David's home, for which he hasn't gotten keys yet, also weird. His friend asks about the for sale sign in his yard, and Zack makes up a lie that his parents wanted to be closer to him while he was away, then says he should be leaving and that he wants to keep his return just between them. That's when Dave's mom returns, and Zack silently jets away before she can see him. David is a little perplexed, but ends up honoring his friend's wishes, saying he was talking to nobody. But double checks just in case Zack is still around. Maybe you'll see him again in another six months. Actually, he just flew off to stop. Hammer time. Uh oh. 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 Gaining access through a roof hatch, he finds the hardware store empty as well, saying everything's the same. Whatever that means, because it looks like quite a bit has changed since he's been gone, and estimates that whatever happened occurred less than a week after he was abducted in issue three. Despondent. Zack lies down on a wooden pallet covered with a tarp, resting his head on what could be a pillow, but may also be a bag of something a hardware store would sell. He nods off for a bit when a pair of voices wake him up, arguing whether or not they got everything in the four times they've been there in the past month, but they'll keep returning to make sure. It's the two goons that attacked Zack's father, Ed, making sure there's no paperwork to trace back to their boss, Mr. Capella when the bank auctions the place off. He sure speaks clearly for a guy with a flashlight between his teeth. And hey, his heavyset cohort actually gets some dialogue. All it took was his third appearance. Also notice these guys were featured on the cover, so three guesses who Zack's holding out the window there. The big guy gets why they've been there, just not now. Which must mean he's extra stupid if that explanation just now wasn't enough. Thing is, any slight evidence that could trace a missing person to the boss is worth their persistence. Pinning something like that on him could be enough to get him behind bars and put us out of work. No, you'd get arrested too, what with the assault and threats and other such criminal activity. Zack makes his presence known, and the lead goon says they're ready for him so he can do his worst. The kid asks where his parents are, and then the same goon tells him to back off, suddenly not wanting to hurt him. You know you're sending mixed signals, right? We're ready for you! Bring it on! Back off! We don't want to hurt you! 
How do you get any gooning done? As the tech jacket begins encompassing him, Zack calls their bluff while reintroducing his foes to the attack tendrils, and then fully armored on a splash page, he recites a classic sci-fi line. Take, Take me, me to, to your, your leader. leader! Better listen to him. His dialogue bubble is encircled in red! <laughs> they eventually agree, taking Zack to their car and driving him to a skyscraper. Inside, they tell the receptionist they have the hardware store owner's son, and a moment later, she relays that they should take the express elevator. They arrive, and the lead goon tries to apologize to their boss, but is told to be quiet. Young Mr. Thompson, we've been looking for you. Does anyone else think it a bit odd that this is the fifth issue, and only now we're getting the main character's surname? Capella says the kid has useful information, assuming his men had threatened him into cooperation as he lights a cigar. Looks like he could have used the emotive flames behind the kid, but Zack's anger gets the best of him, and he flies right into Capella's gut. That's gotta do some damage. He breaks open the window, shot at by the goons, fulfilling the prophecy of this issue's cover. You shouldn't smoke! It's not healthy for you! At least open a window for guests! He demands to know where his parents are, but the crime boss doesn't know. Zack isn't convinced, even though he's holding Baldi's life on the line. Capella would have killed his dad if he could have found him, but figured he skipped town six months back with his family to get away from his debt. Speaking of, now that it seems there's nothing he can do to stop the kid, he declares it cleared, as Zack tosses him aside and jets out. Capella, with some cuts on his skull and face, demands an ambulance, and shoots down the lead goon's idea of going after the kid. Retrieving his cigar, because priorities, he meant it when he said he never wanted to see that kid again, and that the debt was done. On a splash page, Zack hovers over Earth, wondering where his family is. The bonus artwork in the back features him de-jacketed and restrained by some alien device, and none too happy about it. I gotta say, this gave me mixed feelings. On the one hand, how effective or threatening is Capella when he can't find a struggling hardware store owner to collect on a debt? And maybe it was only his vaguely angry expression, but he caved pretty quickly. On the other hand, he did just encounter a powerhouse he doesn't understand, and his men are ill-equipped to counter, so it makes sense he doesn't want to cross paths with Zack again. But you'd think he'd scheme to use the fact that he knows who the kid is to his advantage somehow. But what are you going to do? I guess not every fictional criminal businessman can be a Lex Luthor or a David Xanatos. Finally, issue 6, and Zack is still in space. He begins blaming the Eldarians for needing him to save their planet, but calmly realizes he's acting like a child. And talking to himself. He'll find his parents, as they could only go so far, then focuses on a lake. He rockets there, passing a metropolitan city to the shoreline, wondering why he didn't have this epiphany earlier. On the next page, Zack is instantly in his civilian clothes, no parts of the jacket seen receding, when his dad sees him and rushes over for a hug. He is now shaven and sporting a new hair color, and a shirt with a yellow horizontal stripe with a dog in the center, between the numbers 3 and 1. He was afraid they'd lost Zack, and for some reason this surprises the teenager that had been gone for half a year. Ed takes him inside. We've got a lot of explaining to do. Next time, you leave a note when you go fighting in a galactic war. The fridge has so much space and so many magnets. Inside, we learn that the lake house belongs to Zack's grandfather, though not specified if it's his mom or dad's side and Ed mentions he might want to straight up buy the place, as they've settled into a life in the area. Mom, who's out shopping, again, is working at a department store and Ed at a factory across town. No specifics on what kind of factory. After a week of Zack being a no-show, Ed finally came clean to his wife about his debt to Mr. Capella, the mobster with no first name, but left out the part about Zack's new alien war suit. Two reasons they didn't go to the cops. Turns out the idea of what the government would do if they knew about the jacket never occurred to the kid. Also, no details on how his wife handled being lied to. After a week of looking for their son at night, 
Ed was closing up the store when a car drove by, resembling the one driven by Capella's goons. He ran out the back, not even knowing if it was who he thought, went straight home, and had his wife gather some things to take to the lake house. Grandpa just figured they got kicked out of their home and didn't know Zack was missing, and that's when Ed breaks down. They thought their son was dead and that they abandoned him, but Zack assures him they didn't know his whereabouts, so there was no wrongdoing on their part. The lake house was chosen because they had a good time there the previous year and figured Zack would show up eventually if he was alive and his disappearance was tech jacket related. Huh. It also didn't occur to Capella to see if this guy had any relations he might be staying with. How far away is this lake from their old house? Where even are they? I don't think they ever even mentioned the name of the city they live in. Then the conversation turns to where Zack has been. Some time later, after changing his shirt for some reason, he's finished his tale of mech suit combat and victory over his enemies. Bonus, he scared the deck collection right out of Capella. Good news, though Ed isn't in a rush to find out how true it is. When asked about how well he can operate the jacket, Zack notes how he can fly, his exploding a warship by pushing another warship into it, stunning his dad the tricks he can do, the lasers he can shoot. How he rescued a woman and child only to see them crushed before his very eyes. Yeah, why don't the horrors of combat haunt him more? It really strains the willing suspension of disbelief to have this teenager so well adjusted after a war. The revelry is quickly interrupted by an explosion. On a two-page spread, we see a crushed ship firing on them. And I'm sure the guy in the boat in the lake there just won't have seen anything at all. Now, let's not jump to any conclusions. Maybe the crash are just really lazy fishers. Engaging the jacket, Zack has little choice but to take his dad along, buckling him in for the ride as he fights back against the approaching soldiers. Survivors of the war must have tracked him back to Earth, he figures, and Ed braces himself as his son takes to some melee combat. Realizing the crash are focused solely on him, he decides to let his dad off to get far away. And Ed says, That sounds go to me! It's not often I see typos like that in a comic, but yeah, it can happen. After seeing Ed struggle to run to the house, wow, Zack goes after a cluster of soldiers which take him underwater, albeit briefly. The crash retreat to their ship, but our boy isn't having it. He pushes the ship out of the area, heck, out of Earth's orbit, and throws it into the sun. Good, Good riddance. riddance. Tech Jacket. Play Hot 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 by Buster Poindexter. Purpose of request unknown. It'll be funny, just trust me. Ed emerges from hiding as Zack returns. Pretty sure he's gotten the last of them as Ed jostles a dead crash with his foot. Meaning you think they'll leave you alone from now on, or you think you've certainly committed genocide in self-defense? Ed notes there doesn't seem to be much to these enemies, so he's apparently read the previous issues. And Zack says, no, they're gas. Which seems like a weird thing to say when his mom returns. She is naturally overjoyed to see her son again and the comic closes on her asking where he's been and what's happened, with the splash page showing some of the destruction from the crash as Zack nervously responds, there's a lot to discuss. And those are the first six issues of Tech Jacket. There was a seventh issue advertised to come out in May of 2003, a month after this issue because, you know, that's how comics work, but it didn't happen until 2014. For reasons I can't discern through various searches, issues 7 and 8 of the first volume were reprinted in 2014 from backup stories in Kirkman's other image title, Invincible, specifically 71 through 74 and 76 through 79 respectively. The same year, there was also a three-issue series, Tech Jacket Digital, from a new creative team which spawned yet another series that lasted 12 issues none of which I've read because I didn't know about them until reading up on the series for this review. Sue me. As for these six issues, 
It's fairly entertaining and fun, but nothing especially groundbreaking. I dig the art style, it's reminiscent of some older anime like Tekaman Blade, and man can it get detailed intricately, but it's not without some flaws. Sometimes backgrounds are just gradients, perhaps as a shortcut to any actual detail, and the same gradient trick is used for the sky and a form of shadowing on walls when there is detail. It can lend itself to making characters seem less emotive than they ought to be in a given situation, or look very similar. Seriously, look at David and then look at Ed and tell me there isn't a resemblance. Speaking of looking alike, the panels where Zack's mom is kissing him, one of them is clearly copy-pasted. And then there's the origin of this new hero, which is all too familiar whether you've seen it in Green Lantern or Ben 10. Though, unlike Zack, we would actually get to know the main characters of those particular series. Aside from a pretty standard high school stinks theme and a dad with a struggling business, we don't really get to know Zack. He does good deeds, like defending his father, which, yeah, of course he would, but they don't really get into why he's so quick to join a war. Even the Geldarians don't ask why he's sticking around, and they more or less put their lives in his hands. This whole warfare deal is entirely new to the kid. He has very little time to acclimate. Plus, he sees two people he just rescued from one danger extinguished by another, and that really should weigh on him more. Also know how relaxed he is in taking other sentient life. Yes, they've been labeled as evil, but again, we don't have much to go on with how this war started. Yet he expresses no hesitation, no conflicted feelings, doesn't even question what he's doing, all while the emotional ramifications are barely even touched. Insight on the origins of the war and Zack himself could have been developed in discussion with the Tech Jacket's AI, but they only interact a couple of times and that's it. Maybe the creators thought it would balance out with the fact that we didn't really get to know any of the aliens on either side of the conflict either. They never mention what kicked off the war centuries back, why the Kresh were so bent on destroying Galdaria. Heck, we never even saw what the Kresh looked like, and the entire race might be gonzo. Zack has familiar interactions with characters that are not appropriately identified when they first appear. This happens with the King, who we see before we find out he's the King, as well with Zack's seemingly only friend, who doesn't get named until issue 5, which incidentally is the same issue where we learn that Zack actually does have a last name. From Mr. Capella, who has no first name. Weird little symmetry there. We also don't know the names of his goons, so you just have to keep calling them goons or henchmen or what have you, and we don't know what kind of business that Capella runs during the daytime that hides his criminal activities in the also unnamed city Zack lives by. Yet they go to the trouble of giving names to students that maybe, if we're lucky, we see show up once. Feels like a lot of these were details that they forgot to add in and did so in subsequent issues, if it occurred to them. I also feel like there were times where the panels didn't include quite as much as they could have. Bland backgrounds I've mentioned, but this is more about repeating panels. Moments of silence or emptiness have their place, but the way they went about it felt more like they were padding issues with a copy-paste gimmick. This is especially weird since they tended to be pretty lax about the passage of time within the story itself. Granted, how long he's on that distant planet wouldn't be the same as how much time has passed on Earth, relativity and all that. But they never say how many of the planet's days he was there. Between joining the Geldarians and winning the war, returning to Earth felt like kind of an afterthought for Zack. There would have been better perspective if it had been mentioned how long he'd been in the fight, which didn't seem much longer than a day or two, to be honest, and then return home to find six months had passed. And one of the biggest problems with the story overall, right up there alongside not really getting to know Zack, things are really really easy for this guy. Taking out some loan sharking goons with the personality of 
Lone shark and goons is one thing. Using weapons or skills on an unsuspecting jerk is a common starter point on the gauge of a character's newfound power. But even fighting against aliens that have given an entire planet trouble for centuries is a cakewalk for Zack. Whether it's a small strike force, an army, or an entire warship, he can end a battle in minutes at the longest. His training was a complete breeze, and the only time he seemed to be in any danger is when he was being arrested for suspicion of murder. Which kind of makes you wonder, why didn't Zack's jacket try communicating with Condas and explain the situation, or protect him from being incapacitated? And obviously there's a way for the Gildarians to disable him despite his physical advantage. It is explained that the suits were designed to amplify the abilities of physically frail aliens. Thus, it does make sense that a kid like Zack, who seems very well fed and at least gets exercise walking between home, school, and work, would possess even greater relative abilities. But in six issues, the biggest challenge he faces is finding his parents, and that doesn't even take him more than a day. Even his school life is tame. The worst thing we see is that a girl passes him over for taking her home, and later she does sort of get a kind of comeuppance. Zack isn't seen being constantly teased or bullied or even struggling academically. He doesn't even face any trouble with the cultural differences going to Gildaria. No earth mannerisms mistaken for an insult or him trying to learn the native customs of this planet. The only sort of redeeming factor here is that the jacket's jacked up power would have been the same for just about any other human meaning Zack isn't a chosen one or unique beyond being at the right place at the right time. It would have helped to explore how Zack and the suit kind of need each other and be a great tie-in to better knowing our hero and better understanding the device which allows him such great power. All in all, this comic's not so great. There's potential to be had, even if the concept is arguably derivative, like if the Guardians of Oa gave out Iron Man suits instead of green rings. There are moments of fun and some relatable elements, but it lacks something of a personality all its own, and misses some prime opportunities with its main character to do more than shoot lasers and fly around. Maybe someday I'll see if the subsequent issues deal with any of that.